All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brittany from Apparent Stoic, and I'm with Leah from Common Sense Ethics, and we are going to talk to you today about creating a family culture of virtue. So um, Leah is kind of the expert here. She's written a couple of really good articles on this topic, and I'm someone who's trying to apply them. Um, we're both started starting from kind of a virtue ethics perspective, but Leah also draws from a lot of other traditions. So we're going to be telling you about how we do that and providing some suggestions also for how everyone else can work towards virtue with your family. Um, so before we kind of give the suggestions, I want to give you some background about what family culture is and what virtue is. So Leah, would you like to start with kind of describing family culture? Yeah. Um, family culture is basically how a group of people um, interact, common goals that they share. Um, and basically there's been, there's been a study done out of the University of Virginia that said that family culture um, that, you know, children grow up in is actually more important than, um, than parenting styles. And um, we can link to it in the notes actually for the video. But um, that was kind of surprising to me because you hear so much about um, family, or excuse me, parenting styles and so little about family culture. Um, but yeah, like uh, the other thing is that you, there's very little material online um, about creating like a virtuous family culture in particular. In fact, most of it's um, Christian sources, like mostly Catholic actually from the research that I did. So there's even less out there on a culture of virtue within the family than on family culture in general. Um, whereas parenting styles, you hear about that constantly. I mean, there's probably thousands of books about that, you know, blogs, all kinds of things. So yeah, that was interesting to me. Um, so I thought maybe we, I should be focusing on this more within my own family than I had been. <laughs> but. Right. So maybe family culture could include or is related to parenting styles, but it is kind yeah. of broader. It's more about um, your whole lifestyle and what you want to do with your kids rather than specifically, yeah. okay, these are the words that you say, um, but it's kind of a, a more encompassing picture of how you're going to raise your kids, right? Yeah, that's a good clarification. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And um, my background, you know, I'm not religious, so a lot of the materials that are aimed at one particular religion don't really work that well for me. So I have really become attached to the idea of stoic virtue. So I just want to explain a little bit about what that is, because when a lot of people hear the word virtue, they're like, wait a minute, does that mean you're sitting at home knitting socks? You know, you're not having any fun. It's kind of an old fashioned idea. <laughs> um, so virtue, when we talk about virtue in the stoic sense, it means really excellence, excellence of mind and spirit. It's striving to be the best person that you can be. And it's related to wisdom. So wisdom, courage, justice, and self-control. So I, I picture to myself, I imagine the most um, perfect person and the most perfect parent that I can think of. You know, it's just an ideal. I'm not ever going to achieve that, but it helps. <laughs> <laughs> you probably thought you were before you had children. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, that's a different story. <laughs> um, but I, feel, I find that it's a very good guide Kind of keeping this in my head okay this is what i want to aim for so when i'm doing things with my kids and when i'm creating a family environment of virtue and a family culture i feel like i'm aiming for this ideal even though maybe i'm not ever going to reach that but at least i can work towards that so that's kind of my um where i'm headed with this whole idea of virtue and ultimately the stoic view is that virtue leads to happiness both for yourself as a parent and for your kids. Eventually you can help them find happiness by being virtuous as well in this stoic virtue sense. Yeah, that's a good definition. So, yeah, okay, so um, in your article you mentioned why we even need to talk about family culture. Why can't we just sit back and let things happen the way that they happen? Why do we need to be intentional about cultivating family culture? Um. Well, like I said, you know, it's given that it is really important, you know, for how people develop um, within the context of the family, um, it definitely bears thinking about. And it, like I said, it wasn't something that I was really not thinking about in this context anyway, um, before, you know, I started writing about that and researching it a little bit. But, um, 
Yeah, I, you know, you have to do it intentionally because, you know, people are busy. You know, it's just easy just to just try to get through the day and do everything that you have to do. And, um, you know, you get, you, you're tired, you know, sometimes you get into sort of survival mode. What do I have to do to finish here? Um, and it's too easy to sort of opera, operate like that, you know, like month over month, year over year. Um, yeah, so if you you know that's just basically like your default mode of operating. You know, may, you may have good intentions, but you have to make sure that the you know the norms that you're you're operating under, you know, your family's norms actually line up with um, what what principles you really believe in and want to instill. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that because you're so tired at the end of the day and dealing with kids, little kids especially, but yeah. all kids. Um, it's like you said, it's so easy to get on autopilot. And even if you have really great ideals, figuring out how to implement them at the end of the day, when you're trying to get dinner on the table, everyone's cranky, you need to get homework done. You know, how do you stick with and create a great family culture at that point? So I think you're right. We do have to really think about that and not just the big picture, but also the specific strategies. How do you implement yeah. that yeah. on the ground level? Yeah, because you really, you know, you're not going to get a second chance. <laughs> If you don't do it now, then, you know, or you don't do it while your kids are still growing up, then, you know, you don't get, you don't get to go back and change that. So we were talking about, um, ways that you can kind of ideas that you can implement a family culture. And I really liked, you have an article called creating your ideal family culture. I really like that. So I wanted to mention a couple of these points and then maybe have you go into some detail about them. So first, you mentioned creating a family statement of value. So why would you, that sounds kind of um, kind of businessy, like mm -hmm. a corporate mission statement or something. Yeah. So can you explain a little bit about why you would want to do that in your family? <laughs> yeah, there's probably something better to call it than that. Or you could call it family, yeah, mission statement or statement of value. Yeah, I, 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 if I thought about it for a while, there's probably something more catchy that, that you could call it. But um. Yeah, you know, my husband and I, um, we just uh, we just wrote ours up, and it's um, it's a little bit challenging actually um, to get everything in there that you think you would want. But yeah, basically, what it is is you think about what's most important to you and your husband, and I suppose your children if they're old enough. I mean, mine's not; he's only he's not even three. But um, you know, um, most important to your family in terms of principles and. Um, you know, the types of things you want to create together, the types of values that you want to pass on to your children. And, um, and then you just write it down. Um, and then this, you know, you think you, I, I would probably think it over for a while. Um, cause we had to, you know, we went through maybe one or two, um, incarnations of that, you know, before, <laughs> before it was final. Um, but yeah, the second step would probably be, to examine kind of the norms, you know, um, of your family now and compare them to what you would really want, um, ideally, you know, it has what I, is what I'm doing really in line, you know, not always, no one's going to be perfect, but is, is this more or less in line with what, um, I would really want with what my husband would really want, with what we're trying to teach our children and the types of behaviors that we would, um, you know, want to cultivate in ourselves. Um, cause that's a big one, you know, role modeling. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, examining what you're doing, um, and seeing if there's any discrepancies, for example, one thing that we really struggle with, um, sometimes is, uh, at least recently is, um, we have, we have written in our statement of values, you know, a healthy lifestyle, a healthy eating, but sometimes it's just really easy to get off track. Um, you know, stressful things are going on or you're in a rush, you know, I, I do a lot of scratch cooking and things like that. Um, but you know, just occasionally it just doesn't work out or someone brings junk food into the house. Um, and then, you know, <laughs> you know, you, you eat Christmas, out. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, that just those types of things comparing, like, is what you're doing consistent with what you really would like to be doing? And, um, yeah. Go on. Yeah, I, I really like your, um, you mentioned role modeling, and I think that is a really important thing because it's the classic, you know, do what I do, or you're telling kids to do what I say, but you don't live up to what you're saying. So um, I feel like a lot of parents, you know, just without thinking about it, 
you yell at your kids and then you tell your kids not to yell or you make your kids eat vegetables and then you yourself don't eat vegetables. So I think your kids are never going to um, establish those healthy habits and healthy norms unless they see it coming from you. So to me, that's a big part about being intentional is showing, figuring out what you want to model for your kids, really putting some effort into that. And like you said, okay, sometimes you're going to slip and, and have a cookie or a piece of pie or whatever. But um, as long as you build it into your general family atmosphere, that's yeah. important. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then um, let's see, the third step would probably be finding a way to incorporate the prin your principles into your um, routine. And at least, you know, for me, routines are really helpful. You know, because otherwise, like sometimes I'm just spinning my wheels trying to figure out what I'm, what am I supposed to be doing right now? You know, there's I have a lot of things on my to do list. Like, what what should I be doing? You know, like, but um, you know, it's it's helpful to do that. Um, like for example, I'm a librarian, so we're big into reading. Um, so we just we try to make that a part of our routine. Like either my son and I will read before nap time, or we'll do it before bedtime. You know, we try to do it each day. Occasionally, it doesn't happen. But, um, you know, if you make that part of your routine, so you and your child both expect that to happen and you're used to it, it's much easier to implement it. And it's, you know, then something piecemeal that you just, you know, might get to occasionally. Um, did you have anything to add? Oh, well, that just reminded me um, in a separate article that you wrote called Creating Your Own Culture. Reading good books is one way that you advocate creating your own culture to make yourself happier. And I think yeah. that applies to making your family culture as well. Um, but since you are a librarian and you are a children's librarian specifically, is that right? I am now. Um, I work part time. Um, I just I, <laughs> I actually trained as an archivist, although it's the same degree. It's information science. Um, but yeah, I'm a, now I'm a librarian and I, I've, I've worked in public library on and off and um, I just prefer children's to adult. <laughs> it's easier and um, now I have much more of an interest in children's literature just because my, um, you know, I have my son than I did before. But my mother actually and my sister are also both librarians and they actually both intentionally wanted to be a children's librarian. Whereas, whereas for me, I, you know, my my bachelor's were in history and philosophy, so I, I actually went into this field, and I was an archivist for many years, but it's just easier to, you know, you have to commute into this, like, a city or, anyway, I don't want to get off topic, but it's, you know, my job is very close to my home, and it's easy to work part-time because there's nights and week, night and weekend hours, so that's why I'm doing this now, and I, I may stay doing it, I don't, you know, if I go back to work full-time in several years, I may continue to do that, but, um, but yes, I am a children's librarian, so it's, you know, I see lots of good books from my son, and and I think one parent, one thing my parents did well was my mother, being a librarian, would read to me, I think, you know, until I was pretty old, she knew she would get me books, and um, I, I hope, I like to think that that's done a lot to sort of encourage um, a culture of sort of lifelong learning, you know, I would see my parents reading, my mother's always reading, my dad less so, but he reads, um, and uh, it's good to, when your kids see you reading because they know that you value it. Um, yeah, that sounds like an example of family culture that was passed down from you, yeah. your family that you grew up in. Uh, that was part of that family culture. Now it's becoming part of your family culture with your son. That's really nice. And I think that a lot of times it does get passed down through the generations like that. That yeah. even things that you're not really aware of when you're growing up. That's what you tend to do with your child. So it's good to either pick up on the, the good things yeah. that your parents did or maybe say, okay, I'm going to change some things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's great. Um, do you, what types of books, do you have any recommendations? Well, it really that? depends on the child's age. Um, but that, that book that I mentioned in my, um, in my, uh, the creating of uh, an ideal family culture post, um, honey for a child's heart. That's a great book. And it has a bibliography for children of different ages, really emphasizes a lot of like, good classic literature and the types of things to look for. Um, but yeah, my son's three. So he's just, he's just getting into picture books. You know, before that we had a lot of board books and things like that. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I tend to like, I don't tend to really like fairy tales, at least not the ones that are kind of violent, but um, some of them actually have good moral messages. 
it just depends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I kind of stay away from that stuff. But um, but we do like you know some classic like children's literature and some new things. But um, yeah, I'll put the I'll I'll mention I'll put a link to Honey for a Child's Heart in the um, the notes. But yeah, that book that book has a lot of great suggestions for various age groups. But I don't know, do you have any favorites for your children? Um, well, we're still kind of at the young age too. My kids are five, three, and one. Okay. So I've I've been looking lately for books that talk about uh, good character traits, like being okay. kind and dealing with your frustration in positive ways, because that's something that mm -hmm. I really try to work on with them. My my oldest daughter, for example, she has a lot of issues with frustration and. <laughs> So I, don't we I all? <laughs> yeah, seriously, <laughs> anger management, right? But I feel like that's part of what I want our family culture to be is talking about um, ways to deal with problems, problem solving. How do you deal with anger and frustration? Um, so I have to model dealing with my anger for them, but I also feel like I want to sit down and teach that to them too. So of course, books are a great way to do that, and I'm still looking for some good suggestions for appropriate for a five-year-old and even a three-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, haven't found a, a perfect one yet, so I'm still on the search. There's a book called um, "Have You Filled a Bucket Today?" Have you heard of that? You should check it out. Yeah. It's um, you know, it's like how have you acted today? Have you helped to build other people up? Um, you know, um, were you kind? Uh, things like that. That was, it's definitely good for a five-year-old. Maybe a three-year-old, too. I'm not sure. Okay. That's great. I'll take a look at that. Well, um, so we talked about a family mission statement or statement of value, habits and rituals, shared norms, and you also mentioned family traditions. I think this is something that a lot of people kind of really look forward to doing. Do you have any specific advice for how to incorporate that into your statement of values? Well, it really depends on what your guiding principles are. You know, obviously, if you're Christian, you're, you might want to do different things than um, if you're not. Um, so, yeah, traditions can be based on culture or religion. They don't have to be. Um, for example, one thing that we kind of want to start or that I kind of want to start doing um, is like a, a winter and summer solstice kind of tradition. Like there's some good like, you know, as, like Stoics don't really have holidays, I guess. Um, I guess they, you know, they endorsed the state religion to an extent and they would participate in it. But um, if you think about it, it's kind of um, nature as God. So like, I, I don't know, I'm kind of interested in um, doing like a winter and summer solstice prayer, just something small. Um, oh, that's nice. Yeah, because um, there's a lot of good ones online, you know, prayers for, or, you know, for the equinoxes too and things like that. Maybe that sounds kind of pagan, but it is, I guess. But. Well, it's about nature. Too, yeah, so. it's true. Um, <laughs> but yeah, traditions they're they're similar to um, to like your like routines, except they happen less frequently. So it's something that you know you'd be doing every year or a couple times a year or once a month rather than every um, every day. But yeah, I guess that it really go on. Oh, I was gonna say, or maybe something like once a week, you know, yeah. Sunday pancake breakfast yes, or something exactly. like that. Things the kids look forward to. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it could be anything really. Um, you were gonna well, you were gonna mention things that you do in your family, like um, to help, like sort of promote virtue. I mean, you mentioned like helping your daughter with frustration and stuff, but I mean, what I was thinking, what what other specific things might might you guys do that are more stoic well, or um. Well, one thing that we work on, so my kids are pretty close together in age, and there is a lot of sibling rivalry going on. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it's personality. I, I think it is related to personality as well. My two older kids, my daughter is five, and then my oldest son is three. They're very competitive. They're very outgoing and extroverted, and they love attention, you know, high energy. So they're, they're great. They are going to become world leaders someday, I know. But <laughs> when we're all sitting at home all day together and, you know, they, they, all, they both want the attention and I have only so much attention I can give. You know, there's only so many resources oh I can provide here. So what I've really been trying to focus on is cultivating a, a sense of camaraderie and seeing ourselves as like a team, like we're all in this together. 
So that's, I have not sat down and created a family mission statement yet, but if I were going to do that, since I already have, you know, my three kids, I would really focus on that and include that as a major part. And I, I talk with them a lot about we, we're in this together and we work together. We're happy for each other. When someone gets something good, you know, if your brother gets something good, you're happy for him. If your sister gets something good, you're happy for her. It's not a competition. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, when one person wins, we all win. When one person loses, we all lose. <laughs> like I, I try to, you know, foster this real sense of love and mutual support and caring. And of course, they're little. It's natural yeah. that they're very focused on themselves. Yes, totally natural. But this is something that I, in my particular family, just because of our situation, I really am working hard to overcome that. So that's just one example of how I try to draw on stoic virtues. And, you know, in my head, as I'm doing this, I'm thinking about, okay, wisdom, justice, self-control, how can I teach all of these in the context of getting along together? So, um, you know, I try to bring it down to their level. I think that's obviously, you can't sit around talking about, oh, you know, virtue and wisdom and self-control. You have to put it in terms that they understand and that it makes sense in their life while it's going on. So I, I call them teachable moments. So you're really looking for any way you can integrate that into your daily activities with your child. And once you start looking for it, they're abundant. You find them everywhere. (laughs) Many opportunities for teaching. (laughs) So that's one example of what I do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not dealing with that yet because my second child is yet, yet to be born still. So (laughs) I have to deal with that. But yeah. Um, see one thing that, one thing that we do is, um, Masonius Rufus talks about how a stoic should work the land, how it's, you know, it's good for your, for your mind and body and so on. So, um, and that it promotes determination or like love of work, which is, I actually prefer that translation of, um, of courage, you know, as, you know, at least when you're dealing with little kids, at least sometimes, yeah, like, you know, determination is sort of an attribute of that or, you know, enjoying work. Um, but anyway, so I, I do have him help me garden especially in the spring when we're putting everything in, you know, he has his own garden set and he helps me with that. Um, and another thing that we'd like to do is that we um, ended up with charity on our statement of family values. Um, so for a little kid that could be like, you know, giving away some of your toys. I asked him if he wanted to do that. I said, do you want to give some of your toys to, um, children who don't have, you know, have as many toys or don't have any toys. And he said, yes, but we haven't actually done that, but I'd like to do it at some point. Um, you know, donate some of his toys that he's not using because he seems to have copious amounts. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. I, I love both of those. And we do very similar things um, with my daughter since she's five now. This Christmas, I told her, okay, you're getting, you know, you're bringing a lot of toys in your room. So we need to clean out your room and we're going to give, you know, we're going to choose five of your toys yeah. to give to a little girl who doesn't have as many toys as you do. And, you know, she was great with it. She totally understood. Of course, it helped that she had just gotten, you know, a million toys from her family. But um, I I really like the idea of, you know, not accumulating stuff and being generous. And even a five-year-old, I think, can understand that. So, yeah, that's that's a great suggestion. And um, you mentioned something else that, you know, You mentioned talking about something else that would help with, um, you know, helping kids to flourish, basically, in this sort of, like, environment that we live in. And I was thinking about, um, you know, screen-free time, um, spending time outside, you know, um, or, like, creative play rather than a lot of screen time. I tend to really default to screen time if I'm not feeling well or if one of us is sick or something like that. But just when, when things are going well, you know, trying to, like trying to get away from that you know or limiting it to maybe like a certain amount of time per day um absolutely that's what we do too Mm -hmm. yeah it's Um, really go on oh well I was gonna say and my kids do not use computers or tablets or anything I know a lot of um you know there are a lot of products for children and a lot of my kids friends have some of those but I just feel like you know they're they're going to adopt that technology later on. It's not going to be like they're in middle school and they're like, oh, I don't know how to use an iPhone because I didn't get one when I was five. You know, yeah. they're going to figure that out. So yeah. I feel like right now, as young children, it's much more important for them to have the 
the hands-on time where they're building their motor skills, yeah. they're yeah. You know, play, playing outside, like you said. So yeah, it's super easy to just fall back onto, oh, I'm so tired, we'll just turn on the TV. And um, I do that sometimes too. Yeah. But you're right, I, I think we have to make a real effort yeah. to to say, okay, no, go outside, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's it's it needs to happen even if you don't feel like it. Yeah, it's crazy now because, I mean, you could, you know, some kids spend a lot of time on, a lot of time, you know, on, you know, play. My son actually has a Kindle because for it's for his vision therapy, um, so he plays games on it. Um, so, yeah, it's actually like a vision therapy tool for us. So that's, like, otherwise I don't think he would have one, but... Um, but yeah, he uses that for like maybe 45 minutes a day or something. Um, but yeah, otherwise we would we probably wouldn't have gotten it. But um, but yeah, it's just crazy how much technology there is today and how it's like overwhelming everything else. <laughs> yeah, and I guess families with older children have to deal with that even more because at some point your kids do have to start using technology. So you have to figure out what are the limits. Um, how much can you actually control? Can your kids get around that? When your kids say, but my friends do it, you know, how do you respond? That's actually something that I've I've dealt with already because my, my daughter saw her friends with the technology and I just have to say, that's not how we do it in our family. So I think that, that's another way that we can reinforce the idea of family culture. Okay, some yeah. families do that. Maybe that's okay for their family. Maybe it's not wrong, but we're different. This is how we do things yeah. in our family talking about how other families might do things differently and it's not bad it's not like you're judging them necessarily but you just want to establish yeah. a sense that your family has its own culture not that you're better than other families but you just do your yeah. own thing yeah and I yeah. think that will also give your kids confidence to um you know not follow the crowd as they get older yeah. not feel like they have to do everything like their peers do to know okay well it, it's fine to be me yeah yeah, no, that's 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 really good. I'm gonna write that down so I remember to do it when when I'm dealing with that at an older my children at an older age. <laughs> um, great. Well, I think we've covered your article pretty well. Um, I hope that our viewers have gotten some good ideas um, about how to kind of take the big picture view and establish what principles you want to follow with your family, and then some specific strategies for how to do that every day or your once a year rituals and traditions, things like that. So thank you very much, Leah, for your insight.